whereas STS-61 had helped establish the Hubble Space Telescope as an icon of American ingenuity, STS-95 would update the hero's credentials of one John Glenn. On October 29, 1998, almost 37 years after becoming the first American to orbit the Earth as an original Mercury 7 astronaut, Glenn, now a 77-year-old former U.S. Senator, made his return to space. In contrast to his first flight, a three-orbit, four-and-a-half-hour foray inside the snug Friendship 7 capsule, liftoff of Discovery with a crew of six astronaut heroes and one American legend. STS-95 would take eight days and circle the Earth 134 times. My main reason for being on that shuttle flight was to do research on aging. I was 77, we went up and you know, NASA has charted some 52 different th uh, changes that occur in the human body when you go into space for a period of time. And uh, several of those are very similar to what happens to the natural process of aging right here on Earth. Uh, body's immune system changes, you get less resistant to disease and infection. Uh, body's ability to absorb protein back into the muscles changes for the young people up there and for elderly here on Earth. Uh, the objective was to take those things that are the same and see if we couldn't find any differences between my experience up there and their younger and the younger people I would fly with with the idea of finding in the human body what turns these different systems on and off. If we could do that we might be able to make it possible for people to stay in space longer uh, without harmful effects and maybe cut out some of the frailties of old age right here on Earth. I really was happy to be, be assigned to that flight. In an interesting twist of fate, astronaut Glenn not only inspired both the young and old around the globe, but also a fresh political science and economics graduate, Laurie Garver, the 18th Deputy Administrator of NASA. Having the ability at NASA to fly him again in space after his first flight was something we, I think, gave the nation, and it really helped explain what we were doing on the space shuttle. John Glenn was very, very focused on doing that exper those experiments for both, uh, I think, the older generation, but he was also an inspiration uh, to people growing up. Discovery carried a variety of payloads and research experiments. Arguably, the one most valuable was Glenn himself. Not only did he provide first-time data on what spaceflight might do to the body of a septuagenarian, Glenn also renewed the interest of the nation and the world in America's space shuttle program. While the program had and continued to successfully deploy and service science probes and satellites, as well as conduct on-orbit research, the space shuttle undertook a new, long-range task, perfectly suited to her specialized capabilities. You've got a spacecraft that can carry at least seven people into orbit, and with those seven people, you can do a huge amount of work. One mission you can do multiple EVAs, you've got multiple crew members, you've got a huge payload, uh, just all kinds of capabilities to be able to construct and build bigger things in orbit. Less than two weeks after the Glenn's return to Earth, a Russian proton rocket departs the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan, carrying the Zarya module, the first component of the new International Space Station. Liftoff of the proton rocket and the Zarya control module, the International Space Station is underway. Two weeks after that, Space Shuttle Endeavour follows up with delivery of America's Unity Module, the second piece of this largest space station puzzle ever to be constructed. Houston Endeavour, we have capture of Zarya. Not until July 2000 will the Russian Zvezda Module be added, finally allowing for two Russian cosmonauts and their American Expedition One commander, Bill Shepard, to journey aboard a Soyuz spacecraft to the International Space Station and begin humankind's continuous extraterrestrial presence. Across the world, people are very, very interested in and delighted by the International Space Station and the science that has taken place there. Since only an orbiter's payload bay could hold the station's largest components, the multi-year multi-mission building, outfitting, and servicing of the ISS with cargo and crew would become primarily a job for the shuttle. Amid these dynamic station building missions, 
one seemingly simple and relatively uncomplicated flight would prove problematic and threaten the very future of America's human spaceflight program. Since 1988, the space shuttle had completed 15 years of successful missions. Each was unique, each had its own specific goals and tasks, and each had its own dedicated crew of astronauts who'd trained exhaustively to meet and carry them out. Yet each of those 87 flights did have two things in common. A safe launch, liftoff of the space shuttle discovery, and a safe landing. Nose gear touchdown. From the start, STS-107 seemed to be a mission out of sorts. By the time Columbia was finally ready to fly on January 16, 2003, its planned 16-day mission had been delayed no fewer than 18 times. All those delays had ultimately positioned the STS-107 as a sort of black sheep on the space shuttle program's launch schedule. Columbia's crew commander Rick Husband, pilot Willie McCool, and mission specialists Michael Anderson, Kalpna Chavla, Dave Brown, Laurel Clark, and Israeli astronaut Ilan Ramon would not go to the National Space Station. Their flight would require nothing more risky than orbiting the Earth. Booster ignition and liftoff of Space Shuttle Columbia with a multitude of national and international space research experiments. 82 seconds after launch, what was later described as a suitcase-sized chunk of frozen foam insulation breaks off Columbia's external tank and strikes the leading edge of the orbiter's left wing. Roger roll, Columbia. A routine same-day video review of the launch would reveal nothing unusual. However, higher resolution tracking camera film processed overnight and reviewed on flight day two by the mission's ascent team showed otherwise. You saw this little thing float toward the leading edge of the wing and, and like, uh, you know, it was like a snowball hitting something and then just being pulverized. But, but when you saw it hit, ooh, we just, we just winced because we knew, you know, the vehicle's going 500 miles an hour or better. It was inconceivable in hindsight that you could have that kind of impact um, at the speed that the vehicle was going and assume that there was no damage. And that's what we, we allowed ourselves to feel comfortable that we were right and we were dead wrong. Due to limitations in the visual clarity, the exact point of impact and extent of any damage could not be determined. If the foam strike had compromised Columbia's integrity, little, if anything, could be done to repair the orbiter in space. One week after launch, Mission Control emails the crew informing them of the debris strike. Save for a relatively minor problem with a leaky refrigeration unit, STS-107 had been without further incident. As scheduled, the order is given on the morning of February 1st for the Columbia crew to begin the landing procedure and come home to Florida. Traveling in excess of 12,000 miles per hour, the orbiter's belly begins to glow red as it descends into Earth's atmosphere.